Right, so the sympathizer and Viet Thanh Nguyen. Um, for many Americans, the words Vietnam remain stubbornly seared onto their collective consciousness as a period in history rather than a, mob rather than a modern vibrant country in East Asia that it actually is. And um, that's a shame because it's a beautiful nation with a bright future. And speaking personally as somebody who lived and worked there several years ago, I sincerely hope that we will one day soon come to see the war between the North and the South as only one part of Vietnam's wider story. Western culture, of course, plays a major role in how many of us still perceive Vietnam through countless movies and novels depicting only one war exclusively through American, white, through American eyes. And it's into this context um, that Viet Thanh Nguyen's novel, The Sympathizer, steps. And it's an entertaining and remarkable book, and one that turns the Vietnam cliché on its head by showing what America looks like through Vietnamese eyes. Um, it's already received rapturous reviews in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, and de deservedly so, and I'm sure that many more will follow. The book begins in Saigon in 1975 during the chaos of the American evacuation and follows a young Vietnamese man who is ostensibly a captain in the Southern Army to his new life as a refugee in California. I think the, sympathi the sympathizer has as much to say about America as it does Vietnam and the protagonist's observations on life in both and the contrasts are prescient and frequently hilarious, I'm very pleased to say. Um, so from there on, I won't say any more, but uh, I'll give Viet his opportunity to read and showcase some of this remarkable book to you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Viet Tang Wen. Thanks, John, for that lovely introduction. And as we were talking about before, John actually spent time in Vietnam, so I feel like I'm being introduced by someone who has a, an understanding of part of what this book is dealing about. So what I'm going to do today is read about 15 minutes uh, from the book and save a lot of time for hopefully questions and answers and a discussion with whatever your concerns happen to be. And uh, I'm going to start off with the first couple paragraphs of the book, which if you listen to the radio this afternoon, you already heard that, but the rest of the reading will be, will be different. Um, the novel begins with the fall or the liberation of Saigon, depending on your point of view. And our protagonist is a communist spy in the South Vietnamese army. And the opening of the novel establishes his role in what he's about to do, which is to spy on the efforts of the South Vietnamese uh, to fight their war, but then also later to spy on them as they go uh, to the United States. I'm a spy, a sleeper, a spook, a man of two faces. Perhaps not surprisingly, I'm also a man of two minds. I'm not some misunderstood mutant from a comic book or horror movie, although some have treated me as such. I'm simply able to see any issue from both sides. Sometimes I flatter myself that this is a talent, and although it is admittedly one of a minor nature, it is perhaps also the sole talent I possess. At other times, when I reflect on how I cannot help but observe the world in such a fashion, I wonder if what I have should even be called talent. After all, a talent is something you use, not something that uses you. The talent you cannot not use, the talent that possesses you, that is a hazard, I must confess. But in the month when this confession begins, my way of seeing the world still seemed more of a virtue than a danger, which is how some dangers first appear. The month in question was April, the cruelest month. It was the month in which a war that had run on for a very long time would lose its limbs, as is the way of wars. It was a month that meant everything to all the people in our small part of the world and nothing to most people in the rest of the world. It was a month that was both an end of a war and the beginning of, well, peace is not the right word, is it, Commandant? It was a month when I awaited the end behind the walls of a villa where I had lived for the previous five years, the villa's walls glittering with broken brown glass and crowned with rusted barbed wire. I had my own room at the villa, much like I have my own room in your camp, Commandant. Of course, the proper term for my room is an isolation cell, and instead of a housekeeper who comes to clean every day, you have provided me with a baby-faced guard who does not clean at all. But I'm not complaining. Privacy, not cleanliness, is my only prerequisite for writing this confession. So 
the city falls or is liberated, and his he flees with the remnants of this army to uh, Los Angeles, and his you know his task is to spy on them as they try to organize a campaign to take back their homeland, which really did happen. I was growing up in San Jose, California during the 1980s, and I would go to these uh, Vietnamese community celebrations, and I would see these, these, these exhibits featuring these guys in jungle uniform, camouflage uniform, somewhere in the Thai jungle, and the call was for the community to help give money to them so that they could take back, the, they could fight this war again. And there was a rumor that the very first uh, Vietnamese beef noodle soup chain, pho chain, pho hoa, was started in order to raise funds for this revolution. Never confirmed, but widely suspected by the Vietnamese community. And that also manifests itself in the novel as well. So our narrator, one of the jobs that he gets is to become the authenticity consultant for an epic Vietnam War movie that will be shot in the Philippines. This is completely fictional, has no bearing on reality. Um, so this is what's going to happen next. Uh, he's going to go to the Hollywood Hills to meet the, direct, the, fam the famous director of this movie, known only as the auteur. And the scene that I'm going to read begins with a description of the screenplay for this movie called The Hamlet. Not Hamlet, The Hamlet. All right. And two things you need to know about uh, him, about our protagonist, is that he's half Asian. His father is a French priest, and his mother is a poor Vietnamese woman. The other thing to know about him is that he, when he was in the South Vietnamese military, his job was to be a secret policeman. Both of these details will come up. So here we go with a description of the Hamlet. We own the day, but Charlie owns the night. Never forget that. These are the words that blonde 21-year-old Sergeant J. Bellamy hears on his first day in the torrid tropics of Nam from his new commanding officer, Captain Will Seamus. Seamus was baptized in the blood of his own comrades on the beaches of Normandy, survived another near-death experience under a Chinese human wave attack in Korea, then hauled himself up the ranks on a pulley oiled with Jack Daniels. He knows he will not ascend any higher, not with his Bronx manners and his big knobby knuckles over which no velvet gloves fit. This is a political war, he informs his acolyte, the words emanating from behind the smoke screen produced by a Cuban cigar. But all I know is a killing war. His task, save the prelapsarian montagnards of a bucolic hamlet perched on the border of wild Laos. What's threatening them is the Viet Cong, and not just any Viet Cong. This is the baddest of the bad, King Kong. King Kong will die for his country, which is more than can be said for most Americans. More important, King Kong will kill for his country, and nothing makes King Kong lick his lips like the fair scent of the white man's blood. King Kong has stalked the dense jungle around the hamlet with veteran guerrillas, battle-wisened men and women, who have slaughtered Frenchmen from the highlands to the street without joy. What's more, King Kong has infiltrated the hamlet with subversives and sympathizers, friendly faces only masks for calculating wills. Standing against them are the hamlet's popular forces, a ragtag bunch of farmers and teenagers, Vietnam's own Minutemen, trained by the dozen Green Berets of the United States Army Special Forces A-Team. This is enough, Sergeant Bellamy thinks, alone in his watchtower at midnight. He's dropped out of Harvard and run far from his St. Louis home, his millionaire daddy and his fur-cloaked mother. This is enough. This stunningly beautiful jungle and these humble, simple people. This is where I, Jay Bellamy, make my first and maybe my last stand at the Hamlet. This, at any rate, was my interpretation of the screenplay mailed to me by the director's personal assistant, the thickish manila envelope arriving with my name, misspelled, in a beautifully cursive hand. That was the first whiff of trouble. The second being how the personal assistant, Violet, did not even bother to say hello or goodbye 
when she called for my mailing information and to arrange a meeting with the director in his Hollywood Hills home. When Violet opened the door, she continued with her bewildering manner of discourse in person. Glad to see you can make it. Heard a lot about you. Loved your notes on the Hamlet. And that's precisely how she spoke. Trimming pronouns and periods as if punctuation and grammar were wasted on me. Then, without deigning to make eye contact, she inclined her head in a gesture of condescension and disdain, signaling me to enter. When I crossed over the threshold into the marble foyer, I instantly suspected that the cause of her behavior was my race. What she saw when she looked at me must have been my yellowness, my slightly smaller eyes, and the shadow cast by the ill fame of the Oriental's genitals, those supposedly minuscule privates disparaged on many a public restroom wall by semi-literates. I might have been just half an Asian, but in America, it was all or nothing when it came to race. You were either white or you weren't. Was I just being paranoid that all American characteristic? Maybe Violet was stricken with color blindness, the willful inability to distinguish between white and any other color, the only infirmity Americans wished for themselves. But as she advanced along the polished bamboo floors, steering clear of the dusky maid vacuuming a Turkish rug, I just knew it could not be so. The flawlessness of my English did not matter. Even if she could hear me, she still saw right through me, or perhaps saw someone else instead of me. Her retinas burned with the images of all the castrati dreamed up by Hollywood to steal the place of real Asian men. Here, I speak of those cartoons named Fu Manchu, Charlie Chan, Number One Son, Hop Sing, Hop Sing, and the bucktooth, bespectacled Jap not so much played as mocked by Mickey Rooney in Breakfast at Tiffany's. By the time I sat down opposite the director in his office, I was seething from the memory of these previous wounds, although I did not show it. Still, I was flummoxed by having read a screenplay whose greatest special effect was neither the blowing up of various things nor the evisceration of various bodies, but the achievement of narrating a movie about our country where not a single one of our countrymen had an intelligible word to say. Violet had scraped my already chafed ethnic sensitivity even further, but since it would not do to make my irritation evident, I forced myself to smile and do what I did best, remaining as unreadable as a paper package wrapped up with string. The auteur studied me, this extra who had crept into the middle of his perfect mise-en-scene. A golden Oscar statuette exhibited itself to the side of his telephone, serving either as a kingly scepter or mace for braining impertinent screenwriters. A hirsute show of manliness ruffled along his forearms and from the collar of his shirt, reminding me of my own relative hairlessness, my chest and stomach and buttocks as streamlined as a Ken doll. Great to meet you, the auteur said. Loved your notes. How about something to drink? Coffee, tea, water, soda, scotch. Never too early for scotch. Violet, some scotch. Ice. I said ice. No ice then. Me too. Always neat for me. Look at my view. No, not at the gardener. Jose! Jose! Got the pound on the glass to get his attention. He's half deaf. Jose! Move! You're blocking the view. Good. See the view. I'm talking about the Hollywood sign right there. Never get tired of it. Like the word of God just dropped down, plunked on the hills, and the word was Hollywood. Didn't God say, let there be light first? What's a movie but light? Can't have a movie without light. And then words. Seeing that sign reminds me to write every morning. What? All right. So it doesn't say Hollywood. You got me. Good eye. Things falling to pieces. One O's half fallen and the other O's fallen altogether. Words gone to shit. So what? You still get the meaning. 
Thanks, Violet. Cheers. How do they say it in your country? I said, how do they say it? Yo, 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 is it? I like that. Easy to remember. Yo, 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 then. And here's to the congressman for sending you my way. You're the first Vietnamese I've ever met. Not too many of you in Hollywood. Hell, none of you in Hollywood. And authenticity is important. Not that authenticity beats imagination. The story still comes first. The universality of the story has to be there. But it doesn't hurt to get the details right. I had a Green Beret who actually fought with the Montagnards vet the script. He found me. He had a screenplay. Everybody has a screenplay. Can't write, but he's a real American hero. Two tours of duty, killed VC with his bare hands. You should have seen the Polaroids he showed me. Made my stomach turn. Gave me some ideas, though, for how to shoot the movie. Hardly had any corrections to make. What do you think of that? It took me a moment to realize he was asking me a question. I was disoriented, as if I were an English as a second language speaker listening to an equally foreign speaker from another country. That's great, I said. You bet, it's great. You, on the other hand, you wrote me another screenplay in the margins. You ever even read a screenplay before? It took me a moment to realize there was another question. Like Violet, he had a problem with conventional punctuation. No, I didn't think so. So why do you think, but you didn't get the details right? I didn't get the details right. Violet, hear that. I researched your country, my friend. I read Joseph Budinger and Francis Fitzgerald. Have you read Joseph Budinger and Francis Fitzgerald? He's the foremost historian on your little part of the world, and she won the Pulitzer Prize. She dissected your psychology. I think I know something about you people. His aggressiveness flustered me. And my flustering, which I was not accustomed to, only flustered me further, which was my only explanation for my forthcoming behavior. You didn't even get the screams right, I said. Excuse me. I waited for an interjection until I realized he was just interrupting me with a question. All right, I said, my string starting to unravel. If I remember correctly, pages 26, 42, 58, 77, 91, 103, and 118, basically all the places in the script where one of my people has a speaking part, he or she screams. No words, just screams. So you should at least get the screams right. Screams are universal. Am I right, Violet? <laughs> You're right, she said from where she sat next to me. Screams are not universal, I said. If I took this telephone cord and wrapped it around your neck and pulled it tight until your eyes bugged out and your tongue turned black, Violet's scream would sound very different from the scream you would be trying to make. Those are two very different kinds of terror coming from a man and a woman. The man knows he is dying. The woman fears she is likely to die soon. Their situations and their bodies produce a qualitatively different timber to their voices. One must listen to them carefully to understand that while pain is universal, it is also utterly private. We cannot know whether our pain is like anybody else's pain until we talk about it. Once we do that, we speak and think in ways cultural 
and individual. In this country, for example, someone fleeing for his life will think he should call for the police. This is a reasonable way to cope with the threat of pain. But in my country, no one calls for the police, since it is often the police who inflict the pain. Am I right, Violet? <laughs> Violet mutely nodded her head. So let me just point out that in your script, you have my people scream the following way. Aye! For example, when villager number three is impaled by a Viet Cong punji trap, this is how he screams. Or when the little girl sacrifices her life to alert the Green Berets to the Viet Cong sneaking into the village, this is how she screams before her throat is cut. But having heard many of my countrymen screaming in pain, I can assure you this is not how they scream. Would you like to hear how they scream? His Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed. Okay. I stood up and leaned on the desk to look right into his eyes. But I didn't see him. What I saw was the face of the wiry Montagnard, an elder of the Brew minority who lived in an actual hamlet not far from the setting of this movie. Rumor had it he served as a liaison agent for the Viet Cong. I was on my first assignment as a lieutenant and could not figure out a way to save the man from my captain, wrapping a strand of rusted barbed wire around his throat tight enough so that each time he swallowed, the wire tickled his Adam's apple. That was not what made the old man scream, however. It was just the appetizer. In my mind, though, as I watched the scene, I screamed for him. Here's what it sounds like, I said, reaching across the desk to pick up the auteur's fountain pen. I wrote onomatop onomatopoically across the cover page of the screenplay in big black letters. <laughs> then I capped his pen, put it back on his leather writing pad, and said, that's how we scream in my country. Thank you. I apologize for the screaming. It's not something you typically hear in, in bookstores at literary readings. It's kind of primal therapy for me. Yeah. So if there are uh, questions, I'd be glad to answer any, th any of them. Just, yes. Just go up to the microphone. Oh, back Thank you. Um, I read the review in the New York Times book review, what, three weeks ago maybe? And that's why I'm now reading your book. And um, sorry, I'm going to praise you a little bit. Okay. You have to forgive me. I, I really do find it extraordinary. And um, I know there's been a lot written about Vietnam by men who, American men who serve there. And for various reasons, I've chosen not to read that literature. And I think it was in the Times Review, although it might have been in the New Yorker, it said that there was little written so far from the point of view you're conveying in that book. So that's my first question. My second question, and in a way you just illustrated it, it's something, I've only read half the book, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this, but on the one hand, you use humor very well and on the other hand, we find out that underneath it, you are like surgically touching such painful historic truths with that humor. And that's not something I've encountered that much. 
So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that style. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, Philip Caputo wrote the New York Times Book Review, and for those of you who don't know who he is, he was a Marine lieutenant during the Vietnam War, and he wrote a classic of American Vietnam War literature called uh, A Rumor of War, which I've read, you know. And so it was very important to have someone like him review the book for the New York Times and to say something very nice about the book, which I'm very thankful for. But he starts off the review by saying something which I disagree with, which is that I give voice to the voiceless, which is a trope that's really common whenever some new writer from some minority background or foreign background comes up and Americans are like, wow, we never heard anything from these people before. He's giving voice to the voiceless. <laughs> and uh, it's really disturbing because number one, there, there, there is actually a very substantial body, obviously, of Vietnamese literature about this war, some of which actually has been translated into English. Bao Ninh's The Sorrow of War, Jung Tu Hung's A Novel Without a Name, they're wonderful books. And a huge, uh, quite a substantial body of Vietnamese American literature that precedes me, um, which hopefully you'll have in the bookstore, you know, like Andrew Pham and Monique Jung and Le Tizim Thuy and the, the many, many names, right? So I, I really try to say often, I'm not the first, I'm far from the only, and I do not speak for the Vietnamese people or the Vietnamese American people. I am not the representative, I'm not the spokesperson, don't treat me as such. I wrote this book for myself. I'm sure there are a lot of Vietnamese Americans or Vietnamese people who will disagree with the story that I present in this book. The second part of what you were saying, the comedy, or the, I think of it as a tragic comedy. I, uh, I was born in Vietnam, but I came over at a very young age. I really don't remember anything about the country of the war. And unlike people who, like my parents, who lived through it, I have, the, I have distance from that experience. I'm sure that if you were actually in the middle of it, like my parents were who lost a whole lot or soldiers who fought in the war and so on it's hard to laugh at it for very obvious reasons but with distance from it and as someone who had no direct memory of it i have a, a different relationship to it and i wanted to use comedy and tragedy because i felt that the tragedy was is obvious but the comedy was if you look at this war and how it was fought and everything that went on around it it's absurd the hypocrisies, the failures, the stupidities, not just on the American side, but on the South Vietnamese side, and eventually on the North Vietnamese side, too. So you haven't finished the book, but in the last, the last quarter of the book is an examination of what went wrong on the communist and North Vietnamese side as well. And it is a dark, dark section of the book, but alleviated to some extent, I think, by just really black humor, because, um, you know, comedy is, is distance from pain or something like that. Something. So that's what I try to do in the book. Oh. That's okay. I'm still <laughs> okay, dramatic, yes. So at any rate, I got heard the tail end of your uh, talk on radio today because I had to work, unfortunately. But I heard you say something about how you started off to write a short story or a series of short stories and that that was so much harder than writing a novel. I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit. And, and is, I'm just wondering, is it because you have so much more to say or that it's so hard to condense? Or what is the difference? Yeah, I, I started writing fiction in, in uh, college. And yeah, I thought, I'll write short stories because they're short. Therefore, they're easier. And that simply was not true for me. Uh, so I spent um, 10 years writing a short story collection that was half the length of this book and was an utterly painful, horrible, traumatic experience for me. I really hated doing this. And then, but it, the positive side of that was I got an agent out of it and he said, you gotta write a novel if you wanna be published in New York. I said, fine. I had a lot of ideas, I wrote the novel. And it was, I think for many writers, it, part, of the, part of what we do is we discover what is the right form for us. And for me, it was a novel. Like, you're right, I had a lot to say. It was really hard for me to try to figure out how to say these things in a short story form. So I spent 10 years trying to figure out how to say less, say more with less. That was not my natural instinct. But getting to the novel, I felt like I had, I had all this room, all this space, and it was exactly what I needed to sort of spill my guts uh, for actually twice the amount of space that the short story collection had and <laughs> two years of time to write the novel. And it was really a wonderful experience. I want to thank you also for writing a book that says what so many of us so-called minorities in this country think, and that is, for God's sake, can't you look at the world a little differently, that it's not just your world. And you say it in a way that um, is incisive, and hopefully, hopefully, a third time, hopefully, educative. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, the book is certainly about the Vietnam War and so on, uh, but 
it is very much about, in general, the experience of being an other, of being an outsider, of trying to make your voice heard. And the character in the novel, the protagonist, he's, he's Eurasian, he's of mixed race, which means that he doesn't fit in anywhere. You know, Vietnam's a really racist country. And if you happen to be of mixed race descent, you get treated really badly. The, only, the, the exception to this actually was when Congress passed the Amerasian Homecoming Act of 1980. And then all of a sudden, all these Amerasians, mixed race people descended from American GIs who had been spit upon all their lives in Vietnam, suddenly became literally valuable because they were walking passports to the United States. And people were suddenly saying, oh, oh, I'm proud to be related to you now. Let's go. Or I'm not related to you, but I'll buy you if you want and we'll go. And this really happened. So that was really crucial. And then, of course, I, th I hope that the book is in conversation, not just with Vietnamese people or with Asian Americans, but with all the people of color, minorities in this country, the colonized of other countries, because it draws from a, a much wider body of literature where we have been talking about what it means to be speaking back to the canon, speaking from a position of marginalization and, and exclusion, trying to find the right rhetorical strategies to both speak about our experience, but also to, to, to speak to, to wider communities as well. Hi. Um, uh, as a Vietnamese American, I'm very proud that you are here and writing about experience and glad to, to hear you say that you're not a representative of Vietnamese American community. So I'm glad to, to hear that because we do have a wide, <laughs> wide set of stories. Uh, my question to you is how much is it your family and the community in your observation at growing up in this country, how much does that make into the book because I have not read the book yet so hopefully. well I'll tell you a little something about our protagonist the book is entirely told through his point of view um, and he is a womanizer he is an alcoholic he is a spy um, and he's a murderer in the end and I am none of those things <laughs> okay so uh, it's not autobiographical in any way um, but I I, I you know, the, the, the book starts off by saying, I see things from both sides, I, you know, and that actually is, is me. I've taken my own emotional uh, experiences, feeling, feeling myself to be someone who was on the outside of American society, but also on the inside as well, having grown up here since I was four years old and feeling myself deeply, intimately American, except for those moments when I'm watching, you know, Vietnam War movies, identifying with American soldiers, and they kill Vietnamese people, and they're like, where am I supposed to be at this moment, right? And so that that psychological emotional position is what informs the position of the of the sympathizer in this book. Um, I want to thank you so much. I think your book is really extraordinary and I I know people are calling it a comedy. I didn't, I didn't think it was too funny. I thought it was too real to be funny. Um, but I think I read it within the same week that I read Paul Beatty's The Sellout mm -hmm. and I think it's astonishing that both of you used at Los Angeles as, as such a central part of the book, and it, it's such a searing, terrible view of America, deservedly so, I feel. But I wondered if you had had a chance to read that book, and I, I, I think it's, using Los Angeles for that purpose was really intriguing to me. I love Paul Beatty's White Boy Shuffle, which is also set in Los Angeles, and it's hilarious. I really recommend it, um, and I can't wait to read The Sellout, but it came out right when all the publicity for this book was happening. I haven't read a thing. Uh, well, I've read a couple of things, but you know, I haven't read very much for the last eight weeks and written very little too. And um, I think that, you know, from, from what I understand from White Boy Shuffle and the reviews of the sellout, Paul Bain and I come from pretty similar backgrounds, you know, and you know, we both feel like outsiders, marginalized. We both feel like we're very intimate and familiar with the American literary canon, with American history, with American culture, and yet we're also positioned outside of that at the same time. And that could lead to bitterness, or it could lead to, you know, being a writer and trying to do something with that material. Um, and, in, and, and, and injecting a little bit of that bitterness into into the book, enough to give it to give it some flavor, right? And Los Angeles is a great setting for it. Um, I, I speak as someone who grew up in the Bay Area and could not abide the thought of living in Los Angeles until I got a job there. And now, 18 years later, I think, wow, I can't ever leave Los Angeles. I'm totally a creature of that city by now. And it's the reason why is because it's a global city. You can find everything and everybody in that city, which means you can also find all the good and evil of the human species in Los Angeles too. So it really is a condensation of the United States as a Pacific Rim country, which it increasingly is, and also a condensation of the entire world into, you know, 100 square miles. 
uh, over here. Um, I have a number of friends who served in Vietnam. I did not. I tried to stay out, and I was successful. Um, but uh, many of them have come back with Vietnamese wives. You also have a number of people that uh, friends that we have here who served in Vietnam who have Vietnamese friends who came over and are living in Reston and all kinds of places in this area. Uh, I think fairly wealthy. Two. I never imagined that any of those people could have been spies. Um, to what degree uh, is there some reality behind the plot? Uh, any memoirs, other examples from Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, or now Vietnamese uh, writings that led you on this path? The interior life of the protagonist is entirely fictional, fictionalized, but the plot of the novel is actually drawn from many historical uh, realities. So the spy plot, for example, is based to a certain extent on reality, that the most famous spy in, uh, during the war was a man named Pham Suan An, or Pham Suan An. And yet you know, there's a couple of books about him in English now, uh, The Spy Who Loved Us and The Perfect Spy, I think, both by mainstream American presses. He was famous because he came to uh, California in the 1950s as a foreign student, and he was already a spy. He was sent there to, he was sent to train psychologically to fight the psychological war, which is, what my, which is the inspiration for my character. And then he goes back, and then he becomes a very influential journalist in South Vietnam. All the famous American journalists thought he was their best friend. And it wasn't until the 1980s that they discovered, God, this guy was so important that the Vietnamese Communist Party promoted him to major general during the course of the war for everything he had done in terms of gleaning information from the American uh, political and journalistic bureaucracy. So, and and that, he's just one of many. There were many spies, uh, communist spies, in the very highest ranks of the, of, of the military and the government of South Vietnam. And then even today, uh, there, although the South Vietnamese, all, the Vietnamese American community is diverse in this country, mm -hmm. there is a very vocal portion of it that is deeply anti-communist mm -hmm. and deep, deeply paranoid about the influence of communism in the Vietnamese American community. And, and some of them do believe that there are spies here, uh, or at least uh, of people who are sent here to win Americans over with soft power influence as foreign students, business people, that kind of thing. Thank you. Do I agree? Well, um, yes, in the same way that Americans use soft power constantly to try to influence other countries, it's fair enough for other countries to try to use soft power to influence America, too. There's no one in mind. Well, hello. Hi. Welcome to Washington. Hi, Patricia. Um, I want to share a teaching experience with you and then ask you a question. Um, I taught this semester Jessica Hagedorn's novel about the filming of a certain Vietnam movie in the Philippines. And uh, in teaching that, I showed the, the filmmaker's wife's documentary. And we talked about how they interviewed everybody and they did, there, were no, <laughs> there were no Vietnamese characters in the, in the documentary. And, they, and we talked about how Hagedorn writes Vietnamese characters. Uh, Filipino characters into her novel. So, thank you for writing about Hollywood in your in your novel. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, so, my question was about um, your the fact that you grew up here, and then you went back to visit Vietnam. And in the New York Times, you wrote about how you waited a long time to go back. Um, so, I'd just like you to tell us about what that was like for you and how that um, affected your writing, your thinking about your novel. Thank you. Um, about the first issue, you know, I, when I watched Apocalypse Now, it never occurred to me that those might be real Vietnamese people who are, you know, playing the Vietnamese villagers and so on. And then later on I thought, maybe they're really Vietnamese people because Vietnamese, the so-called Vietnamese boat people, many of them ended up in the Philippines. And then eventually I read, you're talking about Eleanor Coppola, Francis yeah. Ford Coppola's wife, you know, yeah. she made a, a documentary called Hearts of Darkness, which is really a good documentary. And she wrote a book called Notes on Apocalypse Now or something. Mm -hmm. And there she actually does talk about that. Hey, we had Vietnamese people in the Philippines. They were refugees. They were perfect. I was like, that really? And nothing more. I learned nothing. I did learn, you know, through here and there, I learned how, how much they were paid, a dollar a day. And the, the Filipinos were being paid a dollar a day the Filipino laborers who worked on this movie, right? So there's all this good stuff happening that was only in the margins and the footnotes of, of Eleanor Coppola's memoir that I thought, this is, big, this is a, I want to put these people front and center in the book, and that's what happens. Uh, 
and then about Vietnam, um, well, I went, uh, I went back um, for the first time in um, 2002 as a tourist, and that was 27 years after I left. And the reason it took so long was because I just was uh, afraid of going back to Vietnam. My parents were afraid of going back to Vietnam because of the communists. I didn't really care about that. I was afraid of the language issues. I knew some Vietnamese. I'd, worked, I'd lost the language. I, I'd worked really hard to try to get it back, but I knew it was going to be tough. And the emotional issues, like I thought, I, there are relatives back there. I've never met them before. What am I supposed to do? And literally, when I went back to visit my parents' village, uh, my dad's village in North Vietnam, for the first time, we came in at 9 p.m. at night, and then I walked in the compound, and all of a sudden, I was surrounded by like 40 people I didn't know who were my relatives. <laughs> and I, that was bad enough, but then I had studied Vietnamese. I had, I had studied Vietnamese. I had gotten ready for this moment. I had taken notes. I had memorized people's names. I had memorized greetings. And I did not understand a word they said. <laughs> because my parents, that region has a dialect that even other Vietnamese people find incomprehensible. And I was being trained in standard Vietnamese, right? So uh, going back to Vietnam is a very difficult experience for me because um, it's hot. It's humid. I don't like that. And um, if you, if you go back and you visit your home country and your relatives are rich, it's awesome. If you go back and you visit them and they're poor, it sucks. Because it's all, the, all the emotional issues are compounded by the financial issues. And all that stuff is distorted. And that's, that's what I experienced. And then also, um, you know, I, I, in the United States, I feel out of place for all the reasons we talked about. But in Vietnam, I feel out of place for, for a parallel set of reasons, which is that the official discourse of the country is we won. That's good. And what we, you know, and the fact that we put Vietnamese people into re South Vietnamese veterans and so on into re-education camps, that was necessary, you know. And uh, we're rebuilding a perfect heroic society. I don't agree with any of that stuff because I see the, the contradictions and the hypocrisies there. So from a theoretical and political perspective, it's also difficult to be there as well. Thank you. Um. How did you get into this obsessive, perhaps even <laughs> manical, culture of the confession that is so <laughs> central to communist ideology and so-called re-education, and then becomes a framework for your entire novel? Well, as you know, as I was doing research on the Vietnam War for other reasons, you, I would read these I would hear about these confessions and so on, right? So, if if you were a re-education camp prisoner, you would be forced to write your confession many times, just variations after variations, as, they, as, the, as your guards would try to catch you in inconsistencies and so on. And even if you were a civilian and you were living in a city, they would have self-criticism sessions where you would have to write your confessions of whatever you did wrong and so on. And I thought, this is actually really literary. You, it's basically a, an autobiography you're writing, and then you sit in a group and they criticize you and you have to, do, you have to revise. It's like a writing workshop. <laughs> I was like, did no one ever make this connection between the fact that the self-criticism session arises at the same time that the writing workshop model arises in the United States? And so that was the beginning. I thought, oh, this, this is a, I didn't know when I started writing this book that it was a confession. I knew that it was a first person narration and I knew he was talking to somebody. I didn't know who. And I just thought, I'll get there. I'll find out at some point. And two thirds or three quarters of the way through the novel, I realized I know where he's gonna end up. And this is a, this is, this is a justification for writing the book in this way. And then I would go back and put in the confessional parts. Uh, but yeah, that was the reason. The confession is a literary form. And uh, it, the book is a very self-referential self in that way. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I just, I just uh, almost uh, a few weeks ago came back from about a month in Vietnam, second time, and uh, it's a wonderful, I mean, just a wonderful experience, I mean, for people who have never been there or who have all the stereotypes. Um, first time I went was three years ago and with some veterans and uh, it was a very emotional experience, and the group actually is a rotary-based group that supports schools and homeless shelters and so on. But I just want to share a little uh, it's, uh, uh, little factoid that is, in a sense, you might say, is almost like you know a definition of when the war will really end. It's people who go over there, at least the ones I've been with. You know, the impression is for the Vietnamese, it's over. That was a long time ago. The American War was way back. They have a history going back well over a thousand years, invasions and so on. 
but for Americans it hasn't ended. And now I have an idea of how it can end because we went to, one of the places we went to was Kuchi. Everybody goes to Kuchi. But we all, on the way to Kuchi, we stopped at a North Vietnamese army cemetery with supposedly about 10,000 Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, Viet Cong buried. And one of the, the reason we stopped there was because there was a bench erected, a memorial bench, in honor of, guess what? American soldiers. And, and it said uh, for the 25th Infantry Division, which was in that area. Um, and we commented that the war will really end for Americans when we have an NVA or Viet Cong memorial, even a little tiny bench or something in an American military cemetery. Maybe not even Arlington. There's a Confederate memorial there, <laughs> but, but whether there could be one for, you know, the Viet Cong. At that point, I think the American psychological war will end. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's, a, that's an important point. And I don't know if I've been to that cemetery, but I've been to the, uh, they call them martyr cemeteries in Vietnam. Uh, and I've been to the one in Ho Chi Minh City that's right outside, right in the, right in the, uh, right in the, 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 the border, the boundaries of Saigon. And it's spectacular. Um, that one has 50,000 people, soldiers, interred there. The interesting thing about that, though, is that it's on the main highway going into the city and outside of the city. Across from that cemetery used to be the Arlington National Cemetery for the South Vietnamese Army, which back in the day you could totally see from the highway. But now, if you travel along this very important highway, you can't see it. It's been totally built over. There's a Mercedes-Benz factory There's a Mer That's it. right. And, <laughs> and I went to visit. I, first of all, there's no way to f officially find it. You have to ask around the neighborhood and find somebody who lived there 30 right. years ago, and they'll tell you this is where you go. And you go there, and uh, you cannot enter that cemetery without handing over your passport, giving your information. And if you go into the cemetery, as I did, they'll follow you around. And it's the cemetery where all the South Vietnamese soldiers, where many of them were buried. And although you're right in saying that it's important that the, the, the victorious Vietnamese have tried to, re to some extent, to remember the Americans, and it would be awesome if Americans could get over their solipsism <laughs> and remember their enemies, the irony is that no one wants to remember the South Vietnamese. Right. Right. So that Americans who go back to Vietnam say, oh, all of them say, oh my God, they treated me so well. <laughs> but if you're South Vietnamese and you go back, that's not, the, that's not the same experience. We're still fighting the Civil War, you know? And that's why I'm saying when I go back to Vietnam, it's, it's, a, it's a more tendentious relationship because the history of that war, the, the fact that, that, that the South Vietnamese were called puppets and traitors, and the ones who fled overseas were considered to be, by many, to have abandoned the country, and now we're all rich, wealthy, fat Americans, and we come back, can't you give us $1,000 or something? That history is much more difficult, actually, for the Vietnamese people. And that's why that South Vietnamese cemetery is completely overrun. I mean, it's, 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 it's not been maintained or anything like that. And likewise, here in the United States, if you're a South Vietnamese veteran, you're not commemorated on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. This is what I talked about in my New York Times op-ed. We're not, these soldiers, even though they're Vietnamese veterans, are not Vietnam veterans. Mm. We're, not even, we're not even talking about the six million mm. Laotians, Cambodians, and Vietnamese who died during the war who were not commemorated in right. the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. We're just talking about the 220,000 South Vietnamese soldiers who died who were not commemorated. So I think that, although it's important for Americans to remember their Vietnamese enemies, they need to remember their South Vietnamese allies whom they supposedly fought this war for. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. One more question. Okay, um, I share some some things. Um, when I was working at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center as a contractor, we had hired, uh, or my company had hired a number of uh, South Vietnamese engineers, and I got to talk with them. And oh, you can't. Oh, here I'm close now. So um, I got to talk with them, and it was fun. And they, they had, two of them had very different views of their experience of how they were relating to the time when they were in their country. One who said that 
when he was there and he had met the Americans with all of his experience of the Americans, he hated them. He wanted to kill them. But we were getting along, you know. And the other one, completely opposite. Um, he said that he had gone to school one day and he came back and because of the bombing, his house was gone. And he started laughing, you know, as this is the most ridiculous thing possible instead of a great loss. Um, it was very enjoyable, enjoyable talking with them. And it shows, you know, that there are so many stories of Vietnam. Um, everybody has a different story and a different view. One of mine is, is rather humorous. In um, Saigon, I went to a famous restaurant on, on the river and all my own experience with eating crab was the meat was separated and I could eat it so I thought I'm gonna order crab here they bring me a whole crab in a shell and chopsticks <laughs> <laughs> and I just looked at it and they must have had a ball watching this American GI try to figure out how to eat crab with chopsticks and then very end they they took pity on me and gave me something to break the shell. But it, it, it's a lot of wonderful experiences, a lot of heartbreaking experiences. There are a lot of stories, and I hope there will be a lot more stories to come about that time and the people. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you all. Um, this was a wonderful experience. Thank you.